Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. Uh, my goal here is to find exceptional individuals, you know, doctors, clinicians, researchers, etc., and interview them, ask them questions that maybe they haven't been asked before, and bring that info to the listener. So today I have uh, Forrest Rower. He's a uh, microbial ecologist and professor of biology at San Diego State University. He's been uh, referred to me multiple times, so he's a person of high regard in the, uh, the science industry. We're going to be talking about um, the virome in health and disease. So Forrest, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah, just a quick definition. Um, the microbiome I've heard defined and spoken about a lot, you know, the microbes that are not only around us, but in us. But what is the virome? And then let's uh, get into the particulars. The virome is, of course, just the communities of viruses, uh, either in the environment or um, on your body. Okay. And what's your study in particular look at in regards to the virome? Um, So really, my lab invented a lot of the methods um, to look at the virome. Um, in particular, the uncultured methods. So instead of trying to raise one virus at a time, uh, we developed methods to go to like seawater or to a sputum sample, get all of the viruses out of that sample, and then sequence them and determine what's there. So um, in our bodies, you know, from what I've heard, most of the viruses, I guess, are phage, bacterial phage that prey upon the bacteria in us and not our cells, or is it more evenly distributed between viruses that could affect our cells and bacteria? But- yeah, that's a good, uh, good question. There are both all of the viruses that um, infect every one of our cells. We all have lots of retrovir- uh, retrotransposons, as well as herpes viruses, and, uh, in, and another type of virus called uh, transmission transfusion viruses, TTVs. Everybody has lots of these types of viruses that infect their cells. The, and then you're correct that um, your, your gut in particular um, is filled with phage that are uh, attacking the bacteria or are in some sort of symbiosis with the bacteria. When we do the calculations, we do calculate that there are more uh, phage than there are other viruses in your body. But those are really okay. rough, to be honest. Oh, do we know if there's a lot more phage, or do we know the ratio? No, I would say it's it's a little bit um, <laughs> eye of the beholder, because every one of our cells, um, every human cell in our body actually has multiple viruses in it. And you could really make the argument that, in fact, that most much of your genome is is viral in origin. So if you take that number, you would say there are more viruses in the human cells than there are in the gut. But if you actually look for uh, free free viruses, so the virions uh, encapsulating some sort of nucleic acid, then we find um, a lot more phage in that case. When you say every cell has viruses in it, are you talking about the endogenized viral genes that are part of our DNA, or are you talking about free-floating RNA or DNA that is viral in origin that's in the cytoplasm of the cell? Yeah, that, again, a great question. Um, so there are, um, of course, many different uh, proviruses and, and remnant viruses in our DNA. We also see lots of evidence of um, those viruses or, or other viruses being active in our bodies even when we're uh, feeling well. So if we look in blood, we estimate that there's maybe about 10, uh, 100,000 to a million different viruses that we can uh, detect per milliliter, um, even in a healthy person. So what what are you studying then? um, I mean, do viruses, I don't know, what functions would they have 
if they're in our body, but uh, they're not actively making us sick. I mean, and they're not endogenized. But what do they do? Do you think they act as our microbiome and they're actually an essential part of uh, our health? Yeah, I mean, they're definitely um, a, a central part of our health. And as we all know, if we get, um, we, we know that we have these viruses because if you ever get immunosuppressed or even stressed out, you definitely see kind of the rise of the virus. So I think in most cases, they really are in there um, actively uh, uh, testing our immune system, let's say, and we're kind of constantly beating them down. There's reasonably good arguments that um, viral infections do keep the immune system kind of primed. So that's one possibility that maybe they're helpful uh, in some ways. <laughs> uh, but the the observation is that um, we also have a lot of these viruses, especially these like these TTV viruses, are really common um, and they really don't seem to do much at all. Um, they're just hanging out with us. So interesting. What, um, I don't know what's, what's people's guess or estimation that the function that viruses would serve that uh, aren't hurting us, that are just hanging out inside of us. I mean, are they, you know, again, are they beneficial? And how would you figure that out? Are they um, only, you know, pathogenic under certain conditions, like you said, stress or, or immunosuppression? Yeah, so that, I mean, again, it's always a little bit gray with these uh, kind of symbioses. So under some circumstances, we could imagine, and there's even some data that different viruses protect you from other viruses. That would be an exclusion sort of principle. Um, in other cases, uh, that same virus may be a major pathogen. Um, when, for example, you get, um, let's say you fall down and break a bone and you get immunosuppressed because of that, frequently you'll see that the secondary uh, infection, let's call it, from the viruses can cause quite a bit of damage to a person. So it's, we are always associated with lots of different viruses and sometimes they um, uh, are, may be helpful and then other times they may be very harmful. Well, what's, uh, I don't know, does, are you amazed by what you see and what you know or you're like, yeah, it's just another part of life. Like, how do you see this? Yeah, so I think a lot about what we call holobionts, which is basically the assemblage uh, that makes up an individual really animal. And what you do, what happens is over the course of your life, um, whether you're a human or any other animal, is that you acquire viruses and bacteria. And they do become very important for your life trajectory. Um, some of them, of course, we know tons about um, in the sense of that they're good for helping us digest things or whatever. But in other cases, many of them may just be riding along with us as kind of an ecosystem. Um, members of an ecosystem, they probably aren't necessarily doing much damage to us, um, and they may not be uh, really that important in the big picture of the final trajectory of your life. So what, what particular projects do you have going right now? What are you trying to figure out? Yeah, so my main interests are what happens in different ecosystems uh, in regards to the phage, which are the viruses that infect the bacteria. And the two ecosystems I study most are the human lung and in particular a disease of the human lung called cystic fibrosis. And the second is uh, coral reefs. And what I really look at in both of those uh, systems are the relationships between the ecosystem health, the viruses that are there, and how those viruses are interacting with the bacteria. So I'm really interested in kind of these tripartite symbioses between animals, viruses, and bacteria. Um, what do you think the interaction is between our our microbiome, our gut bacteria, or other bacteria in us, and you know, non-phages, but viruses that uh, that are in our cells. Do you think that um, I don't know? There's a recognition by our bacteria that uh, you know the viruses that are in us. Do they contribute? Do you think to immune defense? What do you think that interaction is like? Yeah, so I don't know of very many good examples of like the 
the, let's call them the viruses that infect the eukaryotic cells and the bacteria. There are a couple things, of course, where you get diseases that are caused by the virus that then changes the behavior of the, the gut, which then cascades into um, what happens with the bacteria. I'm actually mo mostly interested in just the opposite direction, which is when you have uh, the bacteria in the gut, they are uh, carrying lots of viruses or prophage, which are the, the phage stuck into their genomes. And they shed those over time. So there's um, the, the cells produce viruses. Then the viruses uh, will bind to the uh, mucus of the gut and form kind of a barrier of viruses that can kill incoming bacteria. So it's a way of building an immune system from the microbiome to protect against bacteria actually invading the, the host through the mucosal membranes. Are these are these viruses in, in our gut mucus? Are they are they part of the the microbes? And the microbes are I don't know, I guess producing I don't know plasmids with them in it, and uh, they're turning into you know full fully active viruses. So like where where do they come from? Like how do they uh, what's their dynamic? Right. So they're they're like the so the a prophage or a provirus are the the when the viruses are inside a cell and they're not actively producing virions, usually uh, the genome of the virus is uh, integrated into the genome of the bacteria. And so what will happen is that under some conditions, um, the, those viruses will become active. And frequently that's not really an all or none thing what will happen is, let's say if you have a thousand cells, one of those cells uh, will be producing viruses. And those viruses then go out and they can do different things in the microbiome. I'm most interested in the ones that get out and protect the human against other bacteria that might come in the system. So in our gut mucus, we have a bunch of viruses in there that, I don't know, have, well, how do they know to sit there and they're sitting there, what, in virion form? And then if certain bacteria enter our gut that are not supposed to be there, the those viruses enter into those bacteria and lice them and destroy them? Correct. And so it's it's actually very interesting because the, the virions themselves have proteins that stick on the outside that are attracted to the, the mucins, which are the main proteins in the mucus. And so the virions are, uh, have been selected to actually target mucus. So they get concentrated in the mucosal layer. And then if you've got a bacteria coming into the mucosal layer, it runs into basically this wall of, of viruses, some of which can infect it and blow it up. So that kind of gives you this um, it, very unusual but interesting uh, mechanism to protect mucosal uh, areas from bacteria that can invade them. And I should say that this is true um, in essentially all animals. So every place that we've ever looked at that has a mucus uh, layer, we find this concentration of these, uh, of these phage that bind to the mucus. Hmm. What, but these viruses, are you able to trace their origin? Again, they're they're coming from certain bacteria that are in our in our gut, or where are they coming from? And how do they know to migrate to this area? Why do they stay there? How do they know what to target? And on and on. Yeah, so it's it's all that <laughs> it's all that great biology. So yes, the source is the microbiome. So the the cells that are normally part of the microbiome are producing the viruses. The reason that they accumulate in the mucus is because they have the these proteins that really essentially slowed them down. So normally you'd have a certain diffusion rate. These guys, because of these proteins, have something we call a subdiffusive rate, which means that over time they accumulate um, in the mucus layer. How they know to kill incoming bacteria is because of a kind of a complicated dynamic, but it's it's not terrible. So if you're a bacteria 
and you're carrying a particular prophage, you're immune to related phage. It's called superinfection exclusion. So what that means is that the bacteria that are normally part of your microbiome are not killed by the phage that are stuck in the mucus. But if you have a closely related bacteria that is not carrying those phage, uh, that prophage come into the system, they run into these walls of these bacteria and they get, they get killed by the phage through lysa. So this really um, means that you're reinforcing a particular microbiome because you have to have the, the prophage that makes you stable in the particular environment you're in. When you say the bacteria carry this phage, what does that mean? It's just sitting in there yeah, in their usually, cytoplasm or is it you know, part of their DNA? It's usually in their DNA, but it can also be um, in different forms. It can be a plasmid. Um, and then sometimes it's even basically a virion that's just hanging out for uh, a limited amount of time within the cytoplasm. Well, I mean, I guess it's weird when you when you consider um, a phage would become part of another creature's DNA. Is it any longer a phage or is it part of that creature? Is that, you know, like the viral DNA we carry that's in our DNA, is that virus or is that us? And does it come out of our DNA and take action and re, re you know, react or sorry, reconstitute and become a virus again? Or does it stay within us and that's it? Yeah, so for the most part, um, the the viral DNA that we find inside the human genome is not able to produce active variants, but there are a fair number of them that still do shed active variants. The one that the ones that tend to be in bacteria cells usually will produce uh, free variants, whether their um whether it's the virion that's the uh is the virus life <laughs> or whether it's actually just the virus when it's part of a cell is kind of a philosophical debate that people um really talk about a lot what's i think really interesting about viruses in general is that any free living virus as we'll call them um is really just an information molecule. So you can take just the DNA or just the RNA, you can inject it into a cell and it will produce a virion, which is really unusual, right? So that's a, um, it's got all of the information to produce the virus all encoded in just that piece of DNA. And you can basically get that to happen in any sort of cytoplasm. There's, of course, uh, the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cytoplasms. But in general, these things are uh, these little machines that can replicate themselves. It's very unusual in biology. But if we're doing, um, you know, like fertility experiments, from what I understand, you know, they've taken the DNA and uh, taken it out of one cell and then put DNA from another cell into that cell the cell was able to grow, at least in some sense, and differentiate and do its thing. So maybe uh, uh, most DNA and RNA has that capability, or at least DNA. Right, but none, it doesn't actually have the ability to get from cell to cell as a particular... Right. Yeah, that's, that's what's unusual about it. Because the way that you can think of it is that DNA in cells, um, there's always something that's left over. So like when you have one cell and it divides into two, then of course, you know, half the DNA molecule uh, in one cell came from the original parent cell and that goes on infinitum. So you're always moving material that's like physically material from one generation to the other. Viruses are different because what they do is they go in and none of the material that went in in the original virus um, actually comes out in any of the progeny viruses. So they're really just the information moving from generation to generation. There's nothing um, material that's moving from generation to generation, which really makes it much more like an information carrying uh, device, not unlike what we do with, um, with books or with writing. We're, we can actually move 
information without physically having things go from generation to generation. So for example, you, you could take a virus, and we do it kind of all the time, and you could take it out, uh, take it out of the virion, get the, take the chemical information, turn that to uh, digital information, send that across the internet as photons, get it back, turn it back to chemical information, put it inside a cell, and you'll get the virus back out of it. So it really doesn't matter um, the, the form, you just have to move information from generation to generation, which is pretty fun. Well, I mean, I don't know. I guess maybe we're splitting hairs here, but you know, in order for the virus to replicate, other substances have to come in contact with it and you know, read its RNA or DNA and then move on to create other viral material. You know, let's say in a, in a human, okay, so the, the, the sperm and egg are a physical material, and then they'll divide in someone. But, you know, like what happens to, like, the first cell that makes you? Is it, is it still there, or is it gone? And if, it, if it's gone, I mean, it's, it's, I guess you can see a person as such a, a serial dilution of material that none of the original material is there. But what constitutes the original material? Right. I mean, you can definitely argue about this forever, <laughs> right? So this is the, the real philosophical arguments about whether a virus is living or not. When you were talking about, um, you know, when I gave the example of our, of our DNA implanted into another cell, um, and you said, yeah, well, okay, sure, it can replicate, but our DNA can't move from cell to cell. What about um, extracellular vesicles? Maybe that is a way that, you know, at least RNA can go from cell to cell and affect the, uh, the cell that it's targeting. Maybe that is our way of using virus-like entities, you know, EVs to, uh, to move our DNA from place to place. Or copy it. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely move DNA around in vesicles, and they're, they are very similar to, uh, to viruses. And there are even kind of entities out there that, that allow, that are viral-like, um, but they don't, they don't actually use shells in the same way that the viruses do uh, to move in something that's much more like a vesicle. And there are, you know, there's even of course, proteins that can do kind of move the information from place to place, um, just as a protein, so prions and stuff of that nature. So these things are very, that it's an interesting part of just biology, right? Is how do you um, manipulate information by these usually quite small compared to the cell entities is really a, uh, you know, a great place to be looking for interesting biology. Yeah, it's weird. You know, if, if viruses are information, then, and, you know, RNA sequences, DNA sequences are code, is anyone looking at it in that way? You know, from like a linguistic sense, um, figuring out the language of RNA and DNA. You know, like I, I hear all the time, oh, there's viral sequences that we've never seen before. But has anyone been able to figure out, okay, a given sequence in the language of RNA or DNA means this or means that or has this ability and why? Yeah, so in some ways that's all of what biology is trying to do. <laughs> but <laughs> that being said, yes. Um, in fact, a lot of the, the original people just looking at nucleic acids were really actually took that uh, approach, which was how to break the code. Right, so we we call it that because the phage group, which were the people trying to kind of figure out, you know, what what is the genetic code, and then how is it interpreted, really used things like a code breaker would, the same sort of tools to really ask what's going on with the genetic code, and it is a pretty valuable way of looking at the system. So you're probably aware that we often talk about uh, Shannon information in regards to both the DNA code and in regular code breaking sorts of fields. So that's a measurement of how um, uh, unique a particular message is or not. So a lot of the DNA, even though it's very um, there seems to be a lot of diversity of it, if you actually look at it as if it were just a code, you'll find that it isn't 
coding for a lot of different things. It's mainly coding for about the same thing. What is unusual about the virus fair is that it is full of a whole bunch of codes that don't match anything that we see in anything else. Well, how do we figure out what those, uh, you know, those genes do or what those codes do? Is there a, I don't know, can you create a test environment where you can see what they do somehow? Yeah, we, we've thought about this a lot and spent a lot of, um, honestly, a lot of work on it. The real challenge um, with this is that the code itself, it really matters the background, right? So if we put the code into a particular uh, cell, it may or may not do something that tells us what's going on. Because you're, it's almost like you've got... Um, you know, different hardware, different software mixtures, um, and that there are so many of them. That being said, there are definitely things that you can do. For example, just taking the the unknown uh, code and turning it into proteins and then looking at the structure, for example. What sort of protein structures do we get out? Um, putting the code into different cells and seeing, does that change the phenotype of the cell? That's where we've been trying to do a lot of work at, and it kind of works. Unfortunately, most of what we get is um, just novel structures and novel phenotypes. So what it's telling us, I think, is that we have still so much diversity to look at. We're not really finding kind of the clustering that you would hope to find, um, where you say, oh, this tells me that this particular structure is actually important for this particular function. So it's a reasonably large challenge. We estimate that there's something like 100 uh, billion different codes out there that we need to understand. Clearly, we can't do it one. 100 billion? At a time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it is a major challenge right now. Um, and of course, you know, we've, we as a group, like, Humanity is focused on phenotypes that really matter to us. Uh, usually, you know, our health or the health of um, our, our animals and, and plants associated with us. But we're getting better and better at looking deeper and deeper into the biosphere to see what these other uh, uh, codes might be doing. It is a major challenge, though. Have you tried um, taking the, uh, the innards of a phage and injecting it into an animal cell and vice versa. You know, maybe the, um, you know, getting through the, the cell wall, the cell membrane, the bacterial membrane is the, is, maybe the code is, I don't know, it can be activated in, in a cell if only it could get in. Have you tried yeah. that? Yeah, so we've got this interesting story, um, which is that the, um, if you just feed phage uh, to uh, like mammalian cells, they'll they'll just take them up and they uncoat them, most of them. So most of them fall apart while they're inside the cell. But we also get transcytose where the, the, the phage um, from the one side, from the apical side, ends up in the basal side. So we definitely know that they're getting in and we know that many of them are getting um, unpacked so that you have free phage DNA there and then we know that some of them get across uh, effectively inside the body you could think of it that way um, what's going on when they're in the cell and if that could be used as a delivery system to get uh, things associated with the phage um, doing something inside a eukaryotic cell isn't known at this particular time um, it would be, it is a very interesting question, but really we don't know at this point. You can get some activities if you, um, particularly if you just um, select for them, but there you're just putting so much pressure on the system that it is, you, you're kind of going to get it to happen no matter what. Um, so whether it's happening naturally or not, um, I don't know. I don't think anybody does at this point. So- so you're saying that bacteriophage do enter into our cells, but once they're in our cells, we don't know what they do, or at the very least, they don't seem to be causing any, any harm. Yeah, we, we know that, that about um, 30 million phage 
move from your gut into your um, lymph each day. And of those, about 90% um, seem to get removed almost immediately. But that other 10%, somewhere in the 10%, seem to be very common um, just hanging out in our blood or our, our lymph. The ones that are inside the cells, when they're in the cell, uh, we don't know what's going on yet. We really haven't figured out much about that. So what we do know is uh, the phage can be trans, uh, transcytosed into the lymph. Presumably, they could be killing bacteria and stuff in that part of our body, so systemically, not just in our guts. And then there's, of course, the opportunity for something to be happening with inside the cell. For the most part, um, people have that have looked have found that the phage do seem to activate some of the antiviral responses when this happens. So it may be, again, like kind of uh, ramping up the immune system um, within the cell, so kind of the innate immune system. But past that, we don't know much. It really is terra nova at this point. Do you, um, do you think that, um, I don't know, various uh, viral material gets packaged up and sent out by a human cell in the form of extracellular vesicles? Has that been observed? Uh, you mean as in phage or as in regular viruses? Because, of course, they're shedding, our cells are, are shedding viruses commonly. Um, how okay, well, well, when you say um, our, shell, sorry, our cells are shedding virus, what does that mean and in what form? They're just coming out of the, the cell membrane or how are they, how are they shedding? Yeah, usually um, for our viruses coming out of our cells, they are being pushed out. Um, uh, they're not blowing up the cell. Um, if you get the, the virus blowing up the cell, of course, it's much more noticeable and you get, uh, that's more your pathogenic viruses. Um, most of these viruses are that we're shedding are kind of chronic infections. So they're being produced, they're putting into vesicles, and then they're being exported and uh, released into either the blood or the interstitial spaces. So that's, that's very common. Yeah, the, the whole thing's very strange. Um. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the, I mean, one of the important things to remember is that every, really, whenever we go looking, the viruses are really doing a whole bunch of uh, different functions biological functions. They're really common. They're by far the most diverse things that we're, we're finding out there. And part of um, our blinders in biology is that we've been really focused on the cells, and we haven't thought as much about these non-cellular fractions, including the viruses, but also the, the liposomes and the episomes and all of these other things that are uh, extracellular. It does seem to be uh, a great place to be looking for new biology. Well, uh, we are constantly eating things and taking things in, air, food, water, etc. Cells mm -hmm. are always taking things in and putting things out, and taking things in and out. So I guess, yeah, if you look at the cell, right, it's bounded by a membrane, but the in and out is a huge part of what's going on with it because that's constantly changing and mediating what's going on. Yeah, and really having major effects on everything. So it really is, um, uh, when you think about the flux through a cell and what, what the cell uh, does with something that comes in versus what comes out the other side, it is really amazing how much of that actually gets directed to producing a whole bunch of virus or virus-like uh, entities. So it's a very, uh, one of the main things happening in biology is actually just production of these uh, of viruses. So what, what hypotheses are you working on right now? What are you looking at? Right, one of our main kind of overarching things that we're looking at is why do viruses sometimes stay in the cell as a provirus and in other cases, uh, become free virions. And what seems to be the main decider of that is the state of the cell itself, metabolism in the cell. So if a cell has a lot of ATP, 
then the viruses tend to make lots of virions. If the cell has um, less ATP and more of kind of the building blocks that you would use, so the anabolic um, metabolisms, the viruses tend to stay inside the cell as proviruses and they do not produce virions. So they're roughly speaking, our working hypothesis is that you can manipulate whether the cells uh, are, or sorry, whether the viruses are staying in the cell um, just by manipulating the metabolic state of the cell. So when, they, um, when we're asleep, for instance, I guess we'd have very low virion production and we're awake and we're active. You know, maybe, um, I don't know if it goes this far, but right after we eat, we have to eat as we digest. Maybe that's the height of our virion production. Yeah, so it's probably a little different. It seems to be that the um, what happens is that if you do, so we're normally um, a little hypoxic, right, in our tissues. So we've got, um, it takes, we've got less oxygen in our tissues because of all the metabolisms we're doing. And that keeps the cells a little anabolic which means that the viruses were not producing as many virions. And of course, if you exercise, you can make yourself very um, anaerobic. And in that case, we would predict that you produce even less virions. Um, when you get stresses, um, things like UV, for example, in uh, infections when the immune system is producing a whole bunch of reactive oxygen species, then you seem to activate, activate a whole bunch of viruses. You can do this, um, you can see this easier in the environment. So if we take seawater, if we just add a little bit of extra food where the, the microbes, uh, uh, because of metabolism, eat up uh, the food and of course draw down the oxygen, then the viruses tend to become proviruses. So they're, they're not doing an active infection. But if you just add back oxygen, we can see that uh, those viruses go back into this virion producing mode. So it seems to be kind of a general rule. And so we're checking that hypothesis across a whole bunch of different um, systems. So does that mean that uh, I guess viruses are, well, the creation of virions at least is cyclical within any given organism? Yeah. I mean, the viral life cycle, it definitely looks like that, that, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, in some cases, the, you've got the, the viruses producing just a whole bunch of new viruses. They're just going in and blowing up things. Um, and in other cases, they're kind of hanging out with the cells. And they seem to be really using central metabolism inside the cell to make that decision. Yeah, this whole thing is very strange. Yeah. But, so what are you trying to determine? What, again, what's governing, what's governing periodic production versus not? And does this give you any insight into the disease process when someone is um, infected with a virus that would cause disease? Does this tell you why there's a latency period or, you know, what governs um, when a virus is going to uh, lyse cells and be active or when it's dormant? Yeah, so that's, that, of course, is kind of central to everything that we're thinking about. So let me tell you a, a little bit about what we think happens on a coral reef, because it's, it's analogous to what happens on, in a human. But on a coral reef, when um, the, the main stress on coral reefs is that humans have killed off uh, most of the fish over about 100 years. And what that's done is it means that um, we don't have as many fish grazing on algae. So you get the systems where we get more algae, and algae produces, uh, through photosynthesis, two things. It produces sugar, of course, um, which then is used to build biomass, and oxygen. And what happens on, as, a, as the coral reef degrades, the, you get more and more sugar accumulating, and the oxygen bubbles off as gas. So you get more and more hypoxic. What that does in terms of the viral uh, dynamics is that the viruses, instead of blowing up a whole bunch of bacteria, actually start 
integrating and hanging out with the, with the cell. So they're no longer producing virions. And you end up with kind of these, what I would say are fat bacteria with, uh, with these endogenous uh, prophage living in them. And that is a very strong signal of this hypoxic environment. Similarly, inside your body, you're, you're, you're hypoxic, right? So you have a lot less oxygen than you do. So you're suboxic is the best way to say that. You have a lot less oxygen than you do in the atmosphere around you. So you spend most of your time really kind of uh, in these anabolic um, uh, states. Again, we think that the viruses are cueing on that. And then in cases where that changes the, the, and you become less uh, suboxic, you get more viral production. And lots of things can do this. And the challenge is, is one, is that actually what's really happening? And two, um, can we use that knowledge to manipulate how the viruses are behaving? Yeah, so what does that mean for a, um, I don't know, let's say you're studying an animal or a person or a bacteria, when is it more susceptible, let's say, to viruses that would be pathogenic versus not? Are there certain states where it's preferentially more immune to them? Yeah, it, it's, um, so I'll give you an example from a bacterial disease where we, we know it better. So in, in cystic fibrosis, we have these areas in the lung get colonized by bacteria um, and over time, they can build up big mucus plugs that are mucus and the bacteria uh, make areas that are very hypoxic within the lung. And when we look at those communities, we see that the viruses, for the most part, are uh, all inside the cells. So we don't really see free viruses or we see very few uh, free virions. Different conditions, um, these can be uh, a whole bunch of things from physiology to changes in the environment around the person, can disrupt those, uh, those biofilm mucus plug systems and really lead to a burst of, uh, of the viruses getting out of the cells. And in some cases, those viruses are um, encoding things that cause a, uh, the human disease to be much worse. So you can see uh, exotoxins and so forth um, being released because you've disrupted the biofilms and you've got a whole bunch of oxygen in there and you've led to uh, virion production. So that's an example of where we might be able to manipulate the level of oxygen available to a microbial community and get uh, different behaviors of the viruses um, oh. with some ha health outcomes. But it's so really the viruses are they're monitoring the condition. I guess I'll, I'll just put it in this terminology. They're monitoring the condition of the host, and then when the environment is not preferential to them, they're acting in such a way as to try to restore the previous environment, or I guess sicken the host, you could put it maybe, uh, so that they can defend themselves. Yeah, they definitely have, I mean, the way I, th I try to, or I think of it is that if the cell looks like it's doing really well, the viruses tend to hang out with the cell. And if it looks like the cell is not doing well, um, then they tend to blow up the cell and get out. So they're kind of the rats leaving the sinking ship in those cases. <laughs> so, which, which is, and, and if we could get a good handle on this, um, then we could, pro I mean, the, the hope is that we could manipulate it um, to get the viruses to behave one way or another uh, to get the outcomes that we're looking for. And that, that really depends on the system, right? And, and uh, what, what you're trying to do. but. Yeah, so it's not just thinking about just, you know, the virus goes in, it goes through an infection cycle, you know, which is mostly how we think about uh, viruses. Uh, instead, you really have to think about when the virus goes in, is it going to uh, uh, go into either being a, a provirus or a prophage, or is it going to just try to produce a whole bunch of virions? And then anytime you look at a cell, you have to ask, is that cell 
um, if we change the physiology of the cell, is it gonna uh, suddenly activate all of the viruses that are already there? Or is um, that physiology going to keep the viruses suppressed? What do you think happens long-term when a virus is inside of a, you know, of a host for years and then generations, or at least years? I mean, yeah, I mean it, how does it change? Yeah, it, of course, you know, if you go through a lot of replication cycles with a virus that never gets activated, um, you'll get mutations and eventually you'll get a virus that's no longer active. Um, and that's very common in, in um, eukaryotic genomes. We, that's where we see all these remnant viruses. Um, for the most part, we, that does, it does happen with prokaryotic viruses, but we don't see uh, as much of it, as much evidence of it. So they tend to um, uh, maintain their active viral production uh, mode more than um, what we observe in eukaryotic uh, viruses. That being said, almost every cell in death systems, like the human body, um, do have so many viruses associated with them um, that a lot of these viruses actually change the behavior of the cell themselves. So they express not all the virus proteins, but they express like one or two proteins associated with the, the virus. Um, and that can really change the behavior of the cell. So you can get uh, uh, really the phenotype of the cell can totally change because it has a pro-virus residing in it. Hey, this is amazing. Well, first, um, you know, unfortunately, we're out of time. What's the, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work and to uh, explore this crazy world of you know, a virus? Yeah, the... Uh, there are, of course, a lot of different um, sources. Um, my work tends to be mostly in the academic literature. Um, I do have a book called uh, Life in Our Phage World, which has a lot of, uh, it's a good starting place for people. The, good. yeah. So Life in Our Phage World, that book's, okay. Yeah, that's um, a good that starting is, Okay, and well, it's, very good. And it's free, you can just get it off my website. So oh, just nice. okay. in my name, you can find it and download it as a PDF. Excellent. Well, oh, great. Well, Forrest, thanks for coming and uh, keep learning. And I'd like to have you back at some point and find out what's new. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.